Welcome everyone for another conversation. And today I have with me um, Julie McCrossan, who's well known to us as a media personality, commentator, MC, and also a cancer advocate. Welcome, Julie. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, you know, as I mentioned briefly um, in our prior sort of confidential little quick chat, I first noticed you on LinkedIn talking about cancer treatment and demystifying it. And I thought it might be useful just to share a little bit about your journey and what got you into this area of work as an advocate. Well, uh, look, thank you. Look, I got involved because in 2013, um, I was diagnosed with stage four oropharyngeal cancer, which was in my tonsils, tongue and throat. The, it's just this sort of region. And uh, I was shocked because I had been a complete non-alcohol drinker since 1979. I had a drinking problem in the 70s and so I gave it up and, and haven't touched the grog. And also I'd given up smoking in uh, very early 1980s. And I just couldn't believe I had throat cancer. And uh, it turns out that there's, a, there's an epidemic, they're using the word epidemic in the United States of uh, cancer in the tonsils, tongue and throat, so it's right at the back of the, the tongue basically, caused by the human papillomavirus, the HPV virus. And worryingly, it's, um, it's increasingly common among young women, although generally it's roughly two thirds men and one third women that get it. And there's about 5,000 uh, diagnoses a year in Australia. So that's the context. And uh, the experience of treatment uh, was extremely hard and tough and my complete ignorance about this cancer, even though both my brothers are doctors, my stepdaughter's a doctor, I, I have had worked a lot in the health area, my complete ignorance made me think if I survive I'd like to try and you know help raise awareness so that other people uh, might get to the doctor quicker because as I learned there's only four stages and if you're stage four in a cancer that's not good news. So, um, well, what a big story. I guess I would like to know, and I'm sure our listeners would know, with such a rare cancer, even though you're saying it's quite common, but people don't really think about it. Uh, what drove you to the doctor in the first place? I had uh, classic symptoms of oropharyngeal cancer. I'll call it throat cancer, just because mm. it's a shorter word. Yes, it is a short word. <laughs> but um, look, I had a persistent earache. I felt like a stick was jammed in my ear and it just wouldn't go away. I had a persistent sore throat and I wasn't sick. Uh, and I'd repeatedly gone to my general practitioner and I'd had all the usual treatments you would have for a sore throat. And I still had this sore throat. And uh, most significantly, I had two small lumps on my neck. Now there are other symptoms, but they're classic throat cancer symptoms. And what's disturbing about my story is that even though I was at a very good GP, I'd been in that practice for many, many years. Uh, it's a practice in the Eastern suburbs of Sydney that trains other GPs, so a well-informed group. I was never referred to an ear, nose and throat doctor uh, for a checkup. And that's so important as a message to anyone listening because my doc GP had looked inside my mouth. You can imagine I'd said <laughs> R and there'd been a stick but often, in fact, very often with oropharyngeal uh, cancer, it's too far down to see through the mouth. And the way they confirm that you've got a tumour is they, you go to an ear, nose and throat doctor and they spray some anaesthesia in your nose and then they put a long tube down your nose. It goes right down here with a little camera. And they've got like a TV screen in their surgery and you can see what's down there. And the minute you look, there was this big growth just a great big lump of stuff. And that's what was causing my persistent sore throat and the earache. And the two lumps were what we call metastases. You know, they were secondaries. Um, and uh, so the, the key point here is, uh, and why I, you say, why did I get involved? I really got involved to influence general practitioners to say, if you've got a persistent, if anyone's got a persistent sore throat for more than two or three weeks, it's not responding to treatment. If they've got a persistent earache, and if most importantly, they've got a couple of lumps on their neck that don't go away, we need referral to an ear, nose and throat doctor so that that more, uh, that different kind of um, check can be done. 
And then of course you, you have a surgical biopsy to confirm that it's a cancerous tumor, uh, not a benign tumor. And so when I finally got to an enos and throat doctor, I was in treatment eight days later because it was urgent. So what was the treatment? Was it, was it really rigorous treatment and taxing like most cancer treatments? Look, the, I, I need to say to your audience, just in case there's anyone viewing who's had head and neck cancer, mm -hmm. and this is oropharyngeal is just one of a number of head and neck cancers, or, or they have a family member who's currently in treatment, it's always possible. Um, I want to reassure people that even though what I'm going to describe now was very tough and it was, I would describe it as traumatic in the full meaning of the word, I would happily do it all again because I'm alive. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's nearly nine years later and I can speak and I can swallow and, uh, and that's a plus. I had to learn to do those things again. But look, in a nutshell, the, the, the two key options are either surgery and that can be surgery that goes in through the side or it can be, uh, if you're lucky enough to be in a part of Australia that has this, it can be transoral robotic surgery. And that essentially is a surgery down through the mouth. Um, that's at the moment predominantly in the private sector. And uh, one of my areas of advocacy is to uh, uh, advocate for more transoral robotic surgery in public hospitals, it, it involves a significant investment in technology and involves training of surgeons. So one key area is surgery and the other key area is radiation. And uh, in uh, the other area of course is chemotherapy. And many people have all three who have my cancer. I had uh, 33 consecutive days of radiation therapy and weekly chemo. And that is a very common treatment uh, for oropharyngeal cancer. And it all depends on where your cancer is, how big it is and what stage. But it's basically either surgery, radiation or both. And chemo is generally involved. So just to take the fear out of those two things for people that, that, that you know, because cancer affects many, many people. Um, how did you find chemo and radiotherapy and, and radiation? And did you get enough information to be informed and know what would happen to you and how you might recover? Look, the key way that you it, it reduce the fear to, to the lowest level possible is that you, have, you go to a cancer centre where there is a multidisciplinary team and where they have a high volume of the cancer that you've got. There is tons of evidence internationally that if you have any kind of cancer, if you go to a cancer center where you're going to have a multidisciplinary team, so that's surgeons, radiation oncologists, mm -hmm. medical oncologists, they're the ones that do the chemo, plus uh, uh, specially trained nurses and allied health, dieticians, speech pathologists, and so on. So if you have a multidisciplinary team and they do a lot of your kind of cancer, you have the best chance of survival and the best chance of uh, comprehensive support during your treatment. So I can't emphasize that enough. And I was lucky, I went to uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney and I did have a multidisciplinary team. That means that my particular case, so they do all these tests and they take them to a group meeting and all the doctors and the allied health and the nurses discuss your particular case and they, they determine your particular treatment. And I, I, that was explained to me. And so that gave me a sense of security. The other thing that really helps reduce the fear is having a nurse coordinator. And one of my areas of advocacy is just as we have a whole national cohort of breast cancer nurses, mm and prostate cancer nurses uh, for gentlemen, pink nurses and blue nurses, as a matter of fact, my, I, before I die, I want to do what I can, that there are a, a cohort of specialist head and neck cancer nurses. Because even though there's 5,000 of us a year um, uh, diagnosed, which is relatively small compared to prostate and breast, we have a very high level of need. And so it is generally uh, accepted that head and neck cancer is one of the toughest treatments to have. And in a nutshell, that's because, I'll talk for myself, the radiation slowly but surely limited almost completely my capacity to swallow. And I lost my voice completely for several months. 
when you have a difficulty swallowing, it means you have to go to liquid food and mm. maintaining a healthy weight is extremely difficult. Uh, I Many um, people are nasogastric fed during treatment, so a tube through their nose. Many people get a tube inserted into their stomach. It's called a peg tube, and they put liquid food into your stomach. Uh, I, just as a personal thing, really didn't want either of those things to happen. And so I had to work very, very hard uh, to continue to swallow liquid food. I lost 20 kilograms in six weeks. Um, my dietitian did want to have me hospitalized and nasogastric tube fed. And my radiation oncologist gave me one more week <laughs> to keep li having liquid food. And it took me up to an hour to an hour and a half uh, to drink one normal glass of liquid food. So that tells you something. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing is that you do get external, external burning. So my uh, neck peeled, which is just a very odd experience. But uh, the most difficult thing for me was the wearing of what they call the immobilization mask. And we'll show a photo of that, I think, in this. And it basically, when you have radiation, there's like a bed and you lie flat and a machine rotates around you. And remember, I had stage four, so I had a lot of tumors, right? So they had to fire radiation. You don't feel the radiation, there's no pain, but they have to fire it in. And in this area, you've got your spinal cord, you've got your brain. It's absolutely critical that you are completely still, or otherwise that radiation that's trying to kill the tumor could damage a critical organ. And so they make a personal mask that covers your whole face. And for me, it went down to about here because my secondaries, my lumps were low and you are clicked down by the head. And I was left alone then for 20 minutes, restrained by the head alone in this bunker um, while the radiation was delivered. And that was 33 consecutive days. And I discovered that being restrained by the head in a very tight fitting mask was a very, very challenging experience. Now, the positive is uh, that I did ask for help and uh, I was given a, a low dose of Valium. I had the same four songs by Simply Red that I found <laughs> soothing and were the almost the exact duration of my treatment. Because as you can imagine, when you've got something over your mesh over your face, you can't see a clock. And um, the nurse came in uh, to hold my hand while I was clicked down. She, of course, had to leave the room. You must be alone in the bunker. I saw a psychologist who gave me some uh, things to think about. I suppose you'd call it cognitive behaviour therapy. All of that came to my aid about four days in. But in my case, and it's not an uncommon story, I was not sufficiently prepared for the psychological challenge of being restrained by the head. And again, you asked me at the beginning, why have you become an advocate? Mm. I'm using all the media skills I have. I've been on radio and television. I've made many videos uh, and I've partnered with a, a brilliant little filmmaker called Daniel Taylor. And we make lots of videos that show uh, all manner of information about all sorts of cancers, but particularly what happens with head and neck cancer and how to prepare the patient and their family before, during and after treatment. Um, so that's my story in a nutshell. And I guess the one thing I would like to say is that it's so important to in cancer, but particularly in head and neck cancer, to prepare the family for all of this. Because uh, I was never an inpatient. Uh, you know, I had this extraordinary treatment. I was on major pain relief, as you can imagine. Um, and my partner, Melissa Gibson, uh, who I'd fortunately been with for about 18 years at the time. So we had a very solid relationship and we had two adult children, one of whom was a medical student at the time. And uh, so I had very good support, but uh, we need to do better inform and prepare families for the home-based care that is a huge part of cancer. And, and not just the physical care, which is big in the monitoring of medications. Remember, I couldn't speak after a few weeks. Um, so they have to speak for you, um, but also the psychological and emotional support. So th th that's my passion. I think the psychological support is really important because it's helping people to get in the right headspace to it's an endurance. You know, it's like a marathon. You're going through something that is really tough and you've just got to move through it. So it takes all of that grit and stamina and with very little preparation, 
that's almost impossible. So you, you, you get thrust into something. Are, are GPs responding if that was your goal with, with the, the, the information you're putting out? They're There's slow a, to take up usually. Look, I, I, I'd like to say my daughter, remember the medical student when yes. I was being treated in 2013? Well, she now is a general practitioner. Ah. So, uh, so I, I, I am acutely aware that general practitioners have a big challenge. They are, they are the gatekeepers to access to specialist care, and they have to be able to sufficiently identify symptoms and refer correctly and in a timely fashion. And that is not an easy gig. So uh, the, I'd, I'd like to focus on the good news. And the good news is the, uh, uh, the Royal Australia and New Zealand College of Radiologists, which is the medical college that radiation oncologists are in, the doctors who deliver the radiation. Um, they have a, a campaign called the Targeting Cancer Campaign. And if your, your viewers and listeners just Google targeting cancer, it will come up. My story is there in six you know, little videos with pictures of me in the mask and getting the mask made and so on. And that is a campaign to inform the general public, but also general practitioners about modern sophisticated radiation therapy and the particular signs and symptoms of all the different conditions, cancers, that can benefit from radiation therapy. And I know that many hundreds of, of general practitioners in that program have gone into cancer centres, into bunkers, seen the technology, seen the advances in technology. And I think it's that kind of systemic education that will assist general practitioners. Uh, another thing is that uh, people involved in medical education are trying to increase the amount of education around uh, radiation therapy particularly, but also more on cancer. But as I say, it's a challenging thing for general practitioners. And I think the honest answer is, there's still a long way to go with oropharyngeal cancer. Yeah. I, I was never referred. I wrote a personal letter to an ear, nose and throat doctor who I had seen previously as a professional voice user. I was a broadcaster on the ABC for over 20 years. I wrote him a personal letter with my symptoms and he saw me within 48 hours and I was in treatment eight days later. So I, I was in trouble and I, would, I probably would be dead if I hadn't written yeah. A personal letter so it, you know it's a it's a serious matter so you knew something was wrong instinctively this wasn't getting better and you know probably google and all sorts of things no, I, I didn't I, google i i actually it's funny you if i may quickly comment yeah. on that you know you said at the beginning about how not to be afraid or to yeah. or to deal with this trauma and i'm a great believer and this is what i did is that i did I, I went to the, a hospital, St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, but I, I could name many others across yeah, Australia yeah. and Sydney, um, where I knew they did a lot of this kind of cancer and, uh, and that they were multidisciplinary. Uh, and remember, they're the two things that I knew from my life experience were important. I got the team and then I trusted them. Because if you Google anything on head and neck cancer, I can tell you it's horrific. Some people never recover their voice. Uh, the damage to the salivary glands caused by radiation, we get a thing called dry mouth, causes extreme dental problems for many. My father was an orthodontist and I was very careful to get to dentists and I'm lucky enough to have private cover. Not everybody is that lucky. Um, so I, I very much trusted my team and they didn't let me down except on one thing and that was the preparation for the mask. And, mm. and that is because I believe, and I think it's well known, that there's been insufficient attention in cancer care to the psychological side, the trauma of the experience and supporting the patient and family. And uh, I think that's because they're so busy saving our lives, to be perfect. Absolutely. Honest. And it's like, let's get them through physically with what's going on. We're not necessarily thinking about mental well-being. I, I guess I want to ask you, at what point did you know or feel as though I'm going to get through this and and how now do you practice self-care having been through a pretty life-changing experience look I don't think I ever was confident I was going to get through it you know I I, I had a as you would understand and anyone who's had <laughs> been affected by cancer would understand you go through an extraordinary turmoil of emotion I, I consider myself a brave and courageous person but I 
I, I really thought and thought and thought, what's happening to you, Julie, when I got this diagnosis? And then I realised I was just terrified. I was mm -hmm. frightened like a little child and I regressed. So I don't think I ever felt secure. I think, like many, I lived, lived with an intense fear of death. And I saw a psychologist about that during treatment, a specialist psychologist at the hospital. And then I was uh, acutely frightened of recurrence. Um, and I think what's helped me very slowly for that to diminish is just evidence. I'm an evidence-based person. I'm a rational person. And for my particular cancer, the longer I live without recurrence, the less likely it is that it will recur. That's not true for every cancer. So when I got to six months, it was better. When I got to one year after treatment, it was better. Mm -hmm. I'm now nine years after treatment and it's better. But uh, do I think, do I feel confident I will live a full life? No, I don't. I, I, I think the rug was pulled out from under my feet and you can never go back. But am I a happy person? Yes, I am. Yeah. So what about self-care now? How do you spend your days? I mean, you're obviously an advocate. You're doing a great job. And that's, it's been an enlightening conversation. What do you do to take care of yourself? Look, my advocacy is pretty obsessive. I'll be honest with you. But it gives me comfort. I think it helps me deal with the fear. I can't explain that, but it's a common reaction. Uh, it also reflects my earlier life. I was a gay liberation advocate. I was a women's lib advocate. I'm that kind of a person. You sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it does comfort me to have to partner with, particularly uh, clinicians. Uh, I'm, I'm one to partner with clinicians and do joint advocacy with doctors, nurses, and allied health. So that actually helps me psychologically. Um, the thing that helps me the most is physical exercise. And at various points in my journey, I have been very active uh, in marathon walks for charity. And, and uh, I've let that go a bit lately and I've put too much weight back on and I, I, uh, I, I need to manage my weight better. Um, so physical activity, advocacy, but most importantly is family. You know, I, I, I think I already knew that family and friends were the most important thing in life. But, you know, I, I, ironically, I'd done a lot of interviews on the ABC with cancer survivors. So I, I actually knew the, the drum, if you know what I mean. But now, you know, I'm lucky enough to be a grandmother. I, I have a little uh, granddaughter called Billy, who's a, a year and a half. Her mum, my stepdaughter, Amelia, the, the busy GP, is heavily pregnant with a second child. Uh, we've moved to Adelaide to help, you know, be, be nanas. And, uh, um, I'm in a really happy family situation and um, that is the deepest comfort. Uh, I am also a person of, of faith and I always, so I, I'm involved with a little church called uh, South Sydney Uniting Church on Zoom where gay, lesbian and transgender and perfectly normal and ordinary people are all welcome. It's a little, <laughs> and, and I attend it by Zoom now. And, and I don't mean by that, that, um, you know, I, after I, I, um, I recovered, I, I did um, go on a marvelous trip uh, to uh, Israel and the, and the West Bank. And as you probably know, Bethlehem is in the West Bank. So I actually went to the church where, you, you know, I'm not trying to be pro, pro, you know, yeah. proselytize in any way. This is totally personal. But I went to where Jesus allegedly was born. Okay. <laughs> and anyway, I was there with a little sign about targeting cancer. Remember that campaign by the <laughs> college? And I, I sat under this tree, where, which is on the site of this church in, in Bethlehem. And then I tweeted out on social media that um, radiation cured my cancer. My faith helped me cope. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so I don't I do. believe, I'm like Nick Cave, the, the marvellous Melbourne singer. I don't believe in an interventionist God, but the camaraderie of my church community, those people caring for me, helped me immensely psychologically and emotionally because I went to church for several months unable to speak I couldn't swallow communion if you know communion you take wine and bread I couldn't swallow the bread I, it took me a long time to get swallowing back and there was something very profound to be that injured um, yeah, but yeah. sadly I got all my eating capacity back and I've put on too much weight so <laughs> if we meet again I hope you'll say my goodness Julie you're so slender <laughs> well thanks for joining us Julie um 
On the screen shortly, you'll see some numbers and some information that Julie shared with us, and we'll see you again really soon. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity. Thank you.